Huge thanks to everyone who tuned into our interview on Machine Learning Street Talk with Jonathan Frankel, co-author of The Lottery Ticket Hypothesis and many more interesting papers. I learned a lot from this discussion. Here are three areas we talked about that I found interesting. If you find these interesting, please check out our full conversation and maybe you'll find the timestamp topic marker in the comments useful for finding the ideas that interest you. A question from Reddit asked if you could find another lottery ticket in the remaining network after taking out the first found lottery ticket. Here's Jonathan answering this question once and for all. Another question from Reddit, Imnimo asks, suppose you try to construct a lottery ticket by taking all the weights that were not part of a winning ticket and retraining from those. Will that model be unable to learn the task or might there be another winning ticket hiding among them or one, one that wasn't mm. originally used? So this is the most common question I get by people who read the original paper. And I, I hope that by answering it here in a public forum, I can answer it once and for all. Um, the challenge in doing this experiment is let's take the MNIST example. So suppose that we find a winning ticket on MNIST. It's going to be about 3% of the original size of the network. So that means that if you remove it, you've still got 97% of the weights left. And so my guess is that if you were to train those 97% of weights, you'll get to the same accuracy as you got with 100% of weights because you've barely pruned the network at all. You could randomly prune by 3% and it wouldn't affect it. And then you could go and find another lottery ticket that's mutually exclusive with the first. You still have 94% of the weights. And you could probably iterate this for a very long time. Probably, you know, you could, you could probably this way find, you know, 10, 15 lottery tickets like this, maybe more that are all mutually exclusive and still leave you with a remaining kind of residual that is capable of training to full accuracy. So the challenge with this experiment is that the lottery tickets are small, which is great, but it means that whatever's left is large enough that, you know, I'm sure there's another lottery ticket in there and another lottery ticket in there and so on and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's an interesting idea in principle, but <clears throat> once you kind of look at the sizes of things, you've still got so much over-parameterization left that I think you'd, you just find more lottery tickets. You can even probably, I'm guessing, swap out one weight from a lottery ticket with another weight, and it wouldn't matter, or swap out a handful of weights. And so combinatorially, the number of lottery tickets is massive, and we're just finding one. It's also like, what would be the application of that, <laughs> finding the second one? <laughs> I mean, it, it, if there were, you know, if, if a lottery ticket were really big, like if it were half the network, it would be interesting to see what would happen to the other half of the network. But we know, so if it, it's kind of, it's a size issue more than anything else that, you know, if only we, it would be nice to compare the, the residual here if, if the sizes were commensurate. And I think that's the intuition a lot of people have when they think about this without, you know, looking too hard at the numbers. It's only when you really dig into the numbers that you that this idea becomes a little bit less interesting, I think. We prune neural networks and remove unneeded weights. Rewinding resets the weights that remain to their value at an earlier training step, rather than to the values that they had taken on prior to pruning. One of Jonathan's papers shows that you can just restore the state of the learning rate rather than the weight values themselves. Like Jonathan, so pivoting into better techniques for finding these lottery tickets, this rewinding algorithm where you, re, where you do the iterative magnitude pruning and then you retrain it, but you just retrain it by restoring the learning rate. I thought that was really interesting that you have that, like you don't reset the weight, but you reset the learning rate. Could you tell me a little bit more about how important it is to have some kind of cyclical learning rate then? And like, doesn't that add more complexity with the learning rate now? Or I'm just curious about like how you figured out this learning rate could be reset. So this is a this is a great question about our recent iClear paper. Uh, the first author, Alex Renda, who's a student in our lab, um, you know, worked really hard on this for the past year, and he got an oral at iClear on this paper. So the let me let me kind of give some context for this because it, it takes on a slightly different problem than what we've been discussing. So the lottery ticket work is all about trying to understand was there a sparse subnetwork early in training that could have done the same work as the full network? Could we have basically replaced training the full network with a smaller network? The particular paper you're talking about, um, which is comparing rewinding and fine tuning and neural network pruning, is all about asking the question, well, you know, if we find a lottery ticket, we've also found a pruned network. Because, you know, you just take that lottery ticket, train it to completion, and now you've got a pruned neural network. Is this a good pruned neural network? How does it compare? What are the sparsities we get out of the lottery ticket networks, and how do they compare to what we got from state-of-the-art sparsity? And so what we did was we just tried taking the lottery ticket algorithm and asking these pruned networks that we get, how do they do compared to 
standard prune networks from other techniques? And the answer was actually pretty good. In fact, about state of the art. And then we tried tweaking one thing. So in standard lottery ticket, you would take your network, train it to the end, prune it, go back to the beginning or go back early on, and then redo this whole process. Now, if your goal is just to get a small network at the end, you don't really care how you get there, maybe you should just keep the weights you had at the end of training. Maybe you shouldn't go back. This is what people typically do in pruning. So the only difference is you take the learning rate for, that you would have gotten from rewinding, but you don't bother to reset the weights. And it turns out that this gets you even better performance. In fact, this kind of, we found for sparse pruning matches state of the art across a wide range of you know networks and, a, and matches a bunch of state of the art techniques that are way more complicated. My hope for this is that not that this is you know the pruning algorithm that everybody will use forever, but that this is such a simple baseline that you know if you want to advertise a new pruning algorithm, you know beat this. Like put this line on your paper and show that your line is better. Like it would be most exciting to me if in the next five years I see our line get crushed by a bunch of other lines because that would suggest that we're making some progress in pruning, which is you know, I'm not sure we've really made that much progress in the past 10 years anyway. That's a separate paper that we worked on in the fall. Um, just quickly to, to that point that you said about the rewinding of the learning rate, how do you, so we kind of had an understanding of why the weights might be a good to be rewound to a certain point, but why would the learning rate, just rewinding the learning rate, um, like offer such a good solution? So let me let me take the alternate perspective and ask what we were doing before we proposed learning rate rewinding, yeah. which is that once you prune the network, you train it for a little while, this is called fine tuning, at the lowest learning rate or at some lower learning rate you had during the training process. And the I the the kind of intuition behind that is that maybe you know you're already late in the training process, you're already close to the optimum, you just need to do a little bit of extra training and you don't want to rock the boat too much. That was kind of the intuition. But I might ask you know, what's the justification for that learning rate over any other learning rate? And so in some sense, by going to this, what really is a cyclic learning rate schedule, where after we prune, we increase the learning rate back to a high learning rate and then work our way back down. You know, it's, I have a lot of speculation as to why that might work, but it's really pure speculation. But by that same token, you know, all we have to support the fine tuning process we did before is also pure speculation. So in some sense, this is an area where we don't really have much to go on right now, and there's an opportunity to do some really good science. Linear mode connectivity is a really exciting way to test if a lottery ticket or subnetwork can be successfully trained. In this clip, Jonathan explains how this connection is formed. I just wanted to backtrack one up quickly. I, I just want to get a better understanding of, so with linear mode connectivity, it looks to me we're training two copies of the same network and they're getting different batches of data, and that's how we're doing the comparison. Could you just explain a little further on how we're describing them being connected? Definitely. That, that's a fantastic question. So the idea is that suppose we have two neural networks and we want to compare them somehow. We want to understand kind of how similar they are to each other. There are so many ways of doing this. There, there, there's a method called CCA that you know looks at looks at the similarity of the representations. You could look at which examples they classify the same and which examples they classify differently. Um, you could look at the the L2 distance between the parameterizations. And one way that we tried a bunch of these, and they're all you know buried in the appendices of the paper. But one way that we found that kind of gave some really clean results was asking, are they in the same optimum? That is to say, can you take the representation of these two networks and find a path between them over which loss doesn't increase? So can you find some valley that connects these networks? And this has been done. There, there are a couple of great papers from 2018 that show that for, in most cases, on standard neural networks, you can actually do this. You can, then all trained neural networks seem to be part of one giant high dimensional valley, and you can find relatively simple paths between them. But you can't find linear paths between them. And we ended up finding that, you know, first, for a specific for the specific examples we looked at in lottery ticket the presence of linear paths seem to be very predictive of whether these networks train to good accuracy which may suggest that although these networks are in some giant connected optimum it may be that the the linear connection suggests some kind of greater degree of similarity or some some you know better relationship or some tighter relationship between the networks than you would get with a nonlinear path and so that's all it is. We're looking to see, you know, what happens on the loss landscape as you go from one representation to the other. Do you encounter some big barrier, which would suggest that they're not in linearly connected optima? Or, or can you just go along this flat path where all the networks in between are kind of equally good? And we ended up finding that in a lot of these lottery ticket situations. And we found a bunch of cases for standard networks where this also happens.